Hello, and a very warm welcome to all our attendees who are joining us in a great number today uh, to this webinar dedicated to the latest property that FI has started to work on and plans to open to the public, which is Palazzo e Giardini Moroni, Moroni Palace and Gardens. I'm Alessandra Varisco, International Fundraising and Development Manager at FI, the National Trust for Italy, the leading organization in Italy which takes care of an invaluable heritage of villas, castles, uh, gardens and landscape uh, that is very distinctive uh, and, is, and they are appreciated by many uh, of you and by so many people around the world. Um, we can do so uh, thanks to the help of very uh, many generous donors who I know are connected today. So I would like to uh, add my special thank you for your continued support and enthusiasm and encouragement, much needed in these difficult times. Uh, today, we uh, will focus on a palace in the heart of Bergamo in Northern Italy that was built in the uh, 17th century and that Fai has been called upon to restore in order to open it to the public and manage it for everyone to enjoy. But before we start, I would like to remind everyone that there is a Q&A button uh, which you can use uh, to send us your questions. And so now let's start as usual with our theme song. If you think you heard the name before, Moroni, you're right. In fact, Moroni, the artist and not the owners of the palace, has gained much visibility in New York in um, 2019 on the occasion of a very important and well-received exhibition at the uh, Frick Collection. And the title was Moroni, the Riches of Renaissance Portraiture. And uh, it was the first uh, uh, major exhibition in the United States to focus on the portraiture of Giovanni Battista Moroni, an essential figure in the Northern Italian tradition of naturalistic painting. The palace, which also bears the name of Moroni, but is not of the same family, hosts the, most, the Moroni's portraits, as well as an incredible fresco, incredible fresco ceilings and walls, interesting and varied collections and a magnificent garden. Um, it has been a private residence for many years until 2009 when um, its owner Antonio Moroni in a very forward looking manner understood that the future of what had been a family home for centuries lied in sharing it with the widest public as possible and created a foundation to manage this palazzo and gardens, the Fondazione Museo di Palazzo Moroni. And as you may know, FI uh, acquires by donation or bequest and also manages properties uh, on concession by state and the province and the regions of Italy. Well, for this specific property, there has been a totally new and innovative, uh, I would say, type of agreement with the foundation that owns the palace and the gardens, uh, whereby FI is part of the board of directors of this foundation and will manage the palace uh, just like other properties that FI owns and manages. And um, it is, a, as I said, a very innovative and detailed agreement that entrusts this property to FI in order to make it, uh, to make one of the most important and iconic buildings in the city of Bergamo available to an increasingly vast public. Uh, we had planned to have with us today Lucrezia Moroni, unfortunately due to uh, time difference, um, uh, it was impossible to have her with us in this very moment, but we were able to uh, record a message with her uh, just a little while ago. So I would like to ask my colleague to send the recording at this moment. Uh, good evening to all of you and thank you very much to participate to this wonderful event organized by FI. Um, You'll be very surprised about this palazzo because it has a, the most unusual combination of fine arts and deco decorative arts. Um, it represents very well my family tradition that from very early age was passionate about collecting. 
Um, you wonder what is so special about this visit. Um, you'll be seeing original rooms completely furnished and uh, with lots of decorative elements as if they were lived in still now. Uh, basically, this house is not a museum. It became a museum because it's a foundation, but it's really a mansion um, that, uh, well, till my father was alive, it was lived in by him. So we're talking about, you know, 15 years ago, but the house was still used as a house uh, by my family. Um, you'll be surprised also how um, you're surrounded by frescoes in every room, mostly, I would say, original. We only had one once a leak and we had a small restoration in one of them in the master bedroom. Otherwise, the 17th century fresco from Barbello are all original and they only were cleaned up um, several years ago when my father was still alive um, with water and sponge, so not with any rest particular restoration. Uh, the also be, you also be surprised and, and it will be very special to visit the part of the house that was redone in 1830 because of a very important marriage uh, from um, uh, Giulia Resta that came in the family and brought from Milano ideas of redecorating part of the house. Um, it's really like entering a jewel. Uh, seeing the empire style, style um, part of the house. The furniture has been there since it was built. Um, it's extravagant. There is a Chinese room, which is so far my favorite. As a child, I used to make uh, Chinese um, entertainment. And uh, um, I really love the fantasy of a decoration that represents uh, the Orient and China. Um, the other thing you'll be amazed uh, is the, the room um, of the Four season where you have in display some of the most important portraits of jo Giovanni Battista Moroni. Um, and you'll be surprised how they fit in perfectly, even though the decor is quite intense. I mean, the ceiling is very, very rich. It is also containing gold leaf. Uh, the furniture is very present, so you don't seem to be in a museum uh, uh, in a setting that is cold and uh, museum-like. It's really a, like the collector, my dad, is there sitting looking at the portraits like he used to do all the time, once a day, and admiring them in silence. So you, you, you'll have this uh, fortune to see and masterpieces in the house. Um, in terms of a um, few stories about my childhood, we used to go and stay for all of August um, to, in the palace because I, we grew up and lived in Milano most of the time. And so the summer was really the moment we appreciated um, the place and especially the gardens. Um, there is a tower, a 13th century tower in the garden that belongs to uh, Verocca in a way, uh, and it's in our territory, but it's really part of Verocca, of Bergamo. And uh, we used to play with my sister. We used to have a playroom on the top floor, and my mom used to have a tea room on the bottom so she could uh, supervise us. And that was one of the most... Uh, joyful place to to play. Um, uh, what's important today is that you you see a unusual sample of a uh, relationship between the Phi and our foundation. Our foundation started in 2009 um, when my dad uh, created it and then unfortunately one year later, he, he passed away. Um, he always talked to me about joining Phi, and I think he tried, but 
unsuccessfully um, many years ago. Uh, so I was left to manage his place and uh, it was quite difficult. And for years it was a struggle to organize events and um, shows and to make the budget work. Um, because it's, uh, we had uh, every year some things to fix and restore and and uh, it's quite a big place and I would say the garden was what actually costed the most of all of the expenses um, but it was worth it. Uh, so I did what I could for about 10 years um, till I decided to reapproach FI and um, Marco Magnifico was one of my oldest friends. We we had uh, in the twenties a lot of fun time together, uh, so it was easy to talk to him and to present um, the problems that I occurred during the um, management of a place. Um, so Marco was immediately very interested in visiting and re-seeing re the place and with a great enthusiasm decided to propose this idea to the FI of doing a joint venture. In other words, the foundation when my father created, it's still alive and I'm the president of it. So someone of the family, direct family will always run the presidency. But in the board, there are more elements now of FI and there are professionals that will take care of all the management with me of a place. So it's a very exciting um, new way of uh, uh, dealing with this place uh, with lots of ideas. And so far, unfortunately, we only have the gardens open because they were the, the more structured and the more um, fixed up places. Um, the house itself needs to be restored and fixed up so that the great public can visit. And it's in the program for, I think, next fall or next winter to start the work. Um, and we are all very excited because it will turn the place really like a, a foundation for the arts, like my father dreamt, and it will be functioning as a museum as well. Um, so I, Thank you again for visiting, and I hope uh, that next time you are able to come to Italy, you'll see it in person instead of um, virtually. Uh, nevertheless, virtually is still a great way of uh, visiting. Uh, so enjoy the visit, and I hope to, to meet you at some point soon. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Moroni touched uh, on uh, a variety of uh, different issues um, and we're glad that she could uh, open uh, this, uh, this webinar and this virtual visit. Uh, I would, uh, after this uh, introduction, and uh, I would like to pass on the baton to my colleague, Sara Menato. You have met her before. She's junior curator from our cultural affairs office and she will guide us in the discovery of this property, its interiors, its collections and its garden. Hello, welcome, Sara. Hello, everyone, and thanks for the having me again. Yours. The screen is all yours. Thank you. I don't know whether you have ever uh, visited Bergamo, uh, which is here, and it's a city in Lombardy. Um, in the pre-Alpine region, it's not far from Milan. Uh, well, when the weather is nice, um you can you can see um the skyline of milan from bergamo it's actually an historic uh city uh, and a very beautiful one composed as you can see of an old uh world core uh, known as citta alta uh, which is upper city and then of a modern part uh, in the plains below, uh, which is called Citta Bassa or uh, Lower City. Uh, the walls that you see here um, 
are called the Venetian walls because Bergamo has been for centuries the westernmost end of the Republic of Venice, the so-called Serenissima. And you see the, uh, the Venetian lion here. Um, by the way, uh, the walls are a UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site since 2017. Um, Palazzo Moroni is right in the heart of the upper city of Bergamo. And um, it is composed of a building, but as you can clearly see here, also by terracing gardens and two hectares of agricultural grounds. And of course, um, this is very rare to find in uh, such a urban co context. Um, and you can see how big uh, the green part is. Um, the property is, is really uh, quite huge. And uh, you can see here the proportion between the gardens and the palace, which is, I would say, astonishing. Um, now, um, let's begin our uh, virtual tour and let's imagine uh, to go and visit uh, Palazzo and Giardini Moroni. So from Milan, you would have go through Bergamo Bassa, uh, where we are here, uh, which is the lower uh, city of Bergamo. And then you would have to drive uh, through this gate, which is the gate of Sant'Agostino. And after that, uh, probably on foot, you would walk on uh, Via Porta di Pinta. So here we are in the upper part of the city at number 12, where there's the entrance of Palazzo Moroni. You can see here that the palace uh, has a quite simple facade, um, especially if you think that it's a 17th century building. So we are in the Baroque period. Palazzo Moroni has always belonged to the Moroni family, as Lucrezia Moroni uh, said a few seconds ago. And um, that is a family who became extremely rich um, thanks to the silkworm farming, which, um, as you know, is based um, on the uh, use of mulberry leaves. And that's why you find the mulberry tree um, on the Moroni coat of arm. Uh, and here I put a fresco detail, which is inside the palace showing the coat of arm of the family. Uh, what's interesting uh, as well is the fact that the mulberry uh, in the local dialect is called muru, and you see that it sounds very much um, like the surname of the family. So these are the reasons that explain such a coat of arm. So when you enter the building, you find yourself in a courtyard, which is dominated by a fountain um, with the sculpture of Neptune, which is the river god. And from here, um, you can reach the main floor uh, going up this uh, grand staircase, which, um, as you see, is an incredible space decorated with frescoes by a local painter who's called the Gian Giacomo uh, Barbello. We are in the 17th century and um, more specifically, uh, the frescoes were commissioned in 1649 by Francesco Moroni, who is the very first owner of this palace, um, actually the person who built it. Uh, these Baroque frescoes are um, very rich in colors and shapes. I put some pictures. Um, they celebrate uh, the Moroni family through characters and stories taken from ancient mythology and literature. Um, as we have heard already, um, Palazzo Moroni became a five property very recently on December 2019. And um, it was meant uh, to open to, to open to the public only in 2021. But um, as a token of recognition, the recognition to the a city of Bergamo, which um, has been uh, sadly famous for being severely hit 
by the COVID flu. Uh, Fondazione uh, Museo di Palazzo Moroni, NFI, decided to open the gardens early uh, last June. Um, if you uh, go and visit the palace now, you can see uh, this uh, grand staircase before um, you exit the palace again and to go to the garden, to go and visit the park. Uh, because uh, the other rooms, uh, the ones that Lucrezia mentioned before, um, are currently under restoration, which are very much needed. But um, uh, we can take a look, of course, in this virtual tour behind uh, these closed doors. Um, this is a map of the main floor, which hosts uh, rooms and halls decorated with frescoes and furniture from the uh, 17th century to the 19th. Um, it is actually in these rooms of the first floor that the Moroni art collection is kept. Uh, this collection consists in a large variety of furniture, art objects, and very important masterpieces, uh, which we're going to see in a minute. Um, this is the, bo the ballroom, uh, which is the biggest hall of the palace, decorated with frescoes by Barbello, as in the staircase. Um, they are splendid. Uh, with this painted architecture um, open to the sky and these figures, as you see, uh, who bow from above the frieze. Uh, I mean, the decoration, the frescoes are uh, really fascinating. Here you can also find two important and rare tables, uh, such as these consoles. Um, they are quite special, actually, because they are tops are made with ancient Roman mosaics from Villa Adriana in Tivoli uh, because they were donated to the Moroni family in the middle of the 18th century. And here's a, a detail. Now, um, we are approaching one of the most beautiful and uh, important rooms of the palace, which is the Golden Age Room where the masterpieces of the collection are kept. Because yes, this is an incredible place for many reasons, as we are going to see, uh, one being the Moroni paintings. You may have already recognized the portraits of Isotta Brembati and uh, of her husband, uh, Gian Girolamo Grumelli, uh, the so-called men in pink. Here they are. Um, we are really in front of two masterpieces of the Renaissance. Um, these two are paintings that made the history of European portraiture. Um, at the Royal Academy, um, a few years ago, before the Freak, the, the, the Freak exhibition, um, I would say six or seven years ago, uh, there was an important exhibition on Moroni curated by Arturo Galanzino and Simone Facchinetti. They are a couple of good friends. Um, some of you may have seen it. The exhibition had the great uh, merit, I would say, of underlining how Moroni has been really a great master. Um, I mean, a painter that really deserves to be uh, in the Olympus of the 16th century art. And these two paintings were both exhibited there. Uh, look on how uh, vivid they are. Uh, this idea of the immediacy, um, as well as the idea of portraying reality in such a direct way, um, this is, of course, probably explained uh, by the simple fact that they were painted directly from life. But there is something like more. 
we need to keep in mind that this idea of portraying reality in such a um, way is uh, really a Lombard way of painting. And it's not a case that Caravaggio, who was born at the end of this same century, was a Lombard painter as well. And um, he was born in Caravaggio, which is in province of Bergamo. This is something we really need to keep in mind when we admire such masterpieces. So they are paintings by Giovanni Battista Moroni, who is one of the most famous North uh, Italian portrait specialists of the 16th century. Meaning that he is, of course, an important painter as a whole, but he's really specialized in a portrait like these two. Moroni has been uh, one of the first uh, painters to use this kind uh, of portrait, which are full length. And are, um, this is a, a portrait that is uh, clearly associated with an official way of portraying. And um, at the same time, he was able to convey the most intimate uh, and real expressions of the figures. Um, you may have realized uh, something uh, very peculiar, um, the fact that the painter is called Moroni and that the palace is called Moroni as well, uh, but uh, the um, painter is not, uh, has never been a member of the same family. So what happens? Uh, during the beginning of the 19th century, Pietro Moroni, who is another protagonist of the story here, um, at that time, he was the owner of the palace. Um, actually, he is the one who's responsible for enriching a lot the collection. So Pietro um, acquired a few paintings uh, by Giovanni Moro Battista Moroni, who was very famous at that time. And uh, he acquired them exactly because they shared the same surname. Um, and that's because he really wanted to give importance to its own family through these great um, masterpieces by this great painter of the past. So um, uh, looking at the, uh, the paintings, um, they um, have the same uh, stunning psychological penetration, but let's look at her first. Um, for example, we can admire the preciseness of the painter's touch in the hair, um, in the jewels, uh, the fur here. Everything is so... Um, masterfully painted that in a way you feel you can touch every detail. Look at her dress, for example. With these golden details of flowers and purse, it's, it's, really, um, it's really something, it's an incredible piece. Every detail is very realistic and true and also the expression. Speaking about her as a person, Isotta Brimbati was a very clever and an incredibly cultivated woman. She was a poetess and um, it, the soul of a very important cultural circle in Bergamo. She was, uh, she was um, such an intelligent uh, woman, uh, able to keep an uh, extremely good relationship with both Venice and Milan, the two most important centers, political centers. Um, as a person, I mean, she, she uh, spoke four languages, um, Latin, uh, Italian, French, and Spanish as well. And there are many stories about her. Um, it, here, she's presented as the perfect wife. Uh, for example, uh, the pearls are a symbol of purity in the sense of the marriage. But uh, she was um, an incredible woman and uh, such a great poetess as well. Um, for example, she was a great public speaker. And we have documents testifying that she had to defend herself in the Senate in Milan 
and that she made such an effective defense speech that she left astonished the entire Senate, which I'm sure was a male one. Um, and um, now let's turn to him, the man in pink. He was her second husband. And I mean, for him, she was his second wife. Um, um, he was uh, one of the leading figures of Bergamo from a political point of view at, the, at that time. Um, look at the ex expression, which is very intense. Um, well, he's very handsome and young. I mean, uh, for the time, he was a mature man, but he was 24. Um, one of the most incredible thing of this portrait is the dress, which is enriched with a silver embroidery. Uh, it's a very precious dress of this uh, very peculiar color. Um, the pink is in heraldic color, and it's connected to the color of the Grumelli coat of arm. Uh, the coat of arm of the Grumelli had this um, specific tone of pink. And it, it's very significant that he chose to immerse, in a way, himself totally in the family colors. I found this uh, quite interesting, actually. Um, in the painting, you can um, see an ancient sculpture and a bas relief with the um, uh, prophet Elia. And there is a Spanish motto, which in English sounds like uh, the latter is better than the first. And this refers to the story of the prophet who loses the coat while ascending uh, to the sky. So we have two elements here, the motto, which encourages the humility and the fake bas relief um, uh, with the symbolic meaning related to the idea of the estate that everyone leaves behind uh, when dying, actually. Um, this painting is signed and dated uh, 1560. And um, so we have a precise date for this painting, while Isotta is a painting painted like a few years before. And just a final note, um, a few years ago, scholars thought that the two paintings uh, were pendant, uh, but actually after a restoration, it became clear that Isotta is an earlier pain painting uh, made not um, at the same time of her husband one. So now we can have a quick look at the rooms decorated during the 19th century such as the yellow room. And um, here we can find uh, 19th century um, uh, landscapes, um, portraits, but also very precious furnishings, such as the, the 18th century Chinese vases or a porcelain clock signed by Jacques Petit. Um, this clock is actually a part um, of a rich, a very rich porcelain collection, which includes works by Sef, uh, Capodimonte, Messen, and so on. There are very significant art objects as well within the same collection. This room. Uh, and the Chinese room in particular um, respond to the very typical taste of the 19th century um, aristocratic palaces uh, for the exotic, I would say, and for the kinoiserie, which spread all across Europe at that time. Um, but now, um, I mean, there is a hidden jewel another one, I would say, um, that we need to explore a little bit, um, which um, it consists in the gardens. Because as we um, already said, the gardens are huge. And uh, as you can see from this picture, um, there's uh, an incredible uh, 
disproportion, I mean, in, in, posit in a positive sense between the gardens and the palace. I mean, uh, there is a jewel that you wouldn't expect from the outside and that you discover when you enter this palace. Uh, the gardens are uh, consist um, of a terracing garden which climbs the hills of Santa Eufemia until the Rock of Bergamo, which is a 14th century fortress. And then after the terracings, there's um, two hectares of agricultural grounds. So let's pretend to be there in this very moment. Uh, you would exit from this um, door uh, next to the grand staircase that we have seen at the beginning. You would walk uh, this way and, um, and then reach the, um, the, this narrow terrace. Um, the gallery is above the fountain of Neptune, uh, which is in the, in the courtyard, actually. You would reach uh, this, which is a formal uh, garden with uh, flower beds and shaped uh, box trees. Uh, there is clearly in this part the taste and the yeah the idea of um, modeling the gardens uh, as a yeah a sculpture would do. Uh, there is a, a, a taste for the art of the garden. And um, of course, we are in the Italian way of uh, uh, designing the gardens. From this narrow terrace, you, would, uh, you can reach the first uh, terracing garden, and which is also known as the secret garden because you can't see it from, um, I mean, from the courtyard. Um, a meadow uh, with flower beds against the walls and trees. Um, yeah, it's really a, a little formal Italian garden. In this area, um, Fai uh, planted a, a butterfly garden. As, uh, as you may know, by planting uh, flowers of um, specific and peculiar species, you can attract the uh, butterflies and bees, and uh, which are very important for the biodiversity. And that's a field that, of course, interests and um, a lot uh, our foundation as well. Um, going up, um, through this stair, um, you reach a second level, um, a second terracing, where are, um, there are other uh, shaped trees, as you can clearly see. Again, the idea of shaping uh, the gardens, um, as well as an architect uh, would do uh, shaping and um, designing um, in architecture. Um, and then there are um, romantic corners as well. Um, in this uh, terracing, there is a tower um, which is known as the Count Think Tower. Uh, it was built during the new medieval, um, in new medieval style on the ruins of an ancient one, of an ancient tower um, that actually once belonged to the Rocca of Bergamo. Um, I mean, from the, yeah, this is the Think, the Count Think Tower. And um, I mean, from there you have a very panoramic view. This is the view that you have from the, you are here in the third terracing. And that uh, after this formal uh, garden, um, the, the visit continues uh, again um, in, the, in the agricultural grounds, which as we said, are two actors of countryside. And it's incredible to think of this landscape um, in, uh, in, right in the center of the upper city. 
this area was added later uh, during the 19th uh, century, and it was made exactly for uh, agricultural purposes. Um, still today here you find uh, a pergola, uh, which is a vine uh, training system and uh, a lot of fruit trees uh, from cherry, walnut, uh, mulberry trees, of course. And, uh, and then there is also a roccolo. Um, I've put a picture here. This is not exactly ours, but I put this picture because I wanted to show you like very clearly what it is. As a roccolo is a circular plant construction which was made um, in the past uh, um, exactly to catch birds uh, during hunting. And uh, hunting, of course, was practiced for both uh, food and recreation. Ours is under restoration, I mean, as well. Um, and this is a picture taken from the inside of the, our roccolo and looking to the sky in a very nice uh, day. And then the, there is a huge um, other part of the, the same area, which, uh, as you notice, is intentionally left by Fai with high grass. Um, this is a picture of last year, actually. Um, the restoration uh, uh, of the gardens are currently um, happening, like uh, in these uh, exact days. And um, here you can really see that uh, uh, this part of the garden in particularly is um, a genuine corner of countryside right in the middle of Bergamo. What's important is the fact that the foundation has decided to enhance this area as well as the part, the more cultural part, uh, one in the, in the palace. Uh, we, we talk about it during the visit uh, exactly as a cultural part of the property, as we really want to give it back its real importance um, uh, within this extraordinary context, uh, showing to visitors how important it is still today uh, to preserve a place like this. So an aristocratic palace, which still keeps alive uh, let's say it's agricultural soul. And um, because the idea behind is that uh, this part is not less important as the historic one. Um, and then there is also the idea that maintain, preserve and enhance uh, nature is important not only for the environment, of course, but also for uh, everyone, for visitors, um, in order to, of course, live in harmony with uh, what's outside us, uh, but also to uh, enjoy a, a very peculiar visit um, and to be able in Palazzo Moroni to get away from our uh, daily and uh, gray uh, city life. So we really uh, welcome you on uh, this property at Palazzo Moroni now to visit the staircase and the gardens and uh, from next September on uh, to visit the masterpieces in the first floor as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. It has been an inspiring tour and myself, I've had the uh, pleasure of seeing only the gardens, um, which are currently open to the public, but not the interiors. Uh, and I can't wait to be able to visit these rooms and, and see with my own eyes this imposing portraits and this furniture and this collection. Now, there are a couple of questions from uh, the public, which I'd like to read. Um, and so, um, and, and so, Sarah, if you'd like to stay on a little bit longer. So the first one is, is, could you please confirm the paintings of Moroni, the painter, are not portraits of members of a Moroni family? Yes, exactly, yes. Uh, I mean, that's really uh, something uh, super interesting. Um, they were yeah, made during the second half of the 16th century 
Um, so they are portraits of Isotta Brembati and Gian Girolamo Grumelli. Um, we are speaking about people uh, of the same province, um, I mean, from the Bergamo region. So the, um, the cultural environment is the same, but they just shared the surname and they were not part of the, of the family. Um, they were acquired um, uh, to enhance the, um, the recognition, the public recognition of the Moroni family. Okay. through the fact that the painter, the Moroni painter um, during the 19th century was very famous. Uh, and that's why, that, that's why the, having this portrait would uh, give importance to the Moroni family as well. Right. So the second one is greetings from Rome. Uh, I have visited, the, but we, we don't have, only have uh, people from the United States, England, Switzerland, and all over Europe, but uh, also people from, um, from Italy, so uh, this is I, this person actually has a, a foreign name. So I have visited the Palazzo on previous occasions, bringing English groups to visit Bergamo, and its palaces are the masterpieces by Moroni to remain in the palace. Yes, of course they remain in the palace, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as 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 we said, as uh, you, Alessandra, uh, mentioned, and I did myself. These paintings are so important that they are asked for exhibitions. But uh, anyway, yes, they will stay in the palace. They are, of course, part of the um, uh, of the collection, and they will, yeah. If they move, I mean, they come back. And the third and last question uh, concerns actually uh, the in, uh, the um, the works in the palazzo. When will they be completed? And I will talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, there's another question, a last one that just came up. The agricultural land within the uh, walled city is amazing. Were houses destroyed to make the space for this in the 19th century? Or was it always open space with another purpose? No, um, uh, there is a great tradition of having gardens um, in, the, in the city of Bergamo and in Brescia as well. So, I guess that's um, something very peculiar to these uh, cities, which are quite close. So um, they were acquired by the family, uh, but they were still, I mean, significant part were already um, used for agricultural purposes um, when they were acquired during the 19th century. Well, the one uh, interesting uh, issue wasn't that the palace that stood in front of the Yes, that's exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. In order to, yes, um, the agricultural fields are, let's say, behind the palace, but in front of the palace, yes, the family decided to acquire the palace in front and to destroy it because they wanted a very nice view. Um, but yes, in front, uh, in front of the palace, yes, yeah. Okay, another last question. Apart from the splendid palazzo, were the Moronis famous for any other reason? The Moroni meaning the... Um, Moroni, I think the family. The I family, think. yeah. No, no, yes. Um, I mean, it was a such a very rich, uh, a very rich family that, um, I mean, the importance um, was a, an economic importance uh, at the beginning, yes. And then little by little, it became um, even, more, I mean, uh, the significance became, was more like a political one, but uh, at the beginning they were a, an extremely rich um, family. Okay, well, thank you, Sara. So now our public knows that our projects are possible uh, thanks to the help of many generous individuals, Italians, but also donors from abroad and uh, who believe in our work and, and Palazzo Moroni is in fact FI's major commitment for 2021 and 2022. It is our focus this year to, uh, to fundraise in order to open it partially, as uh, Sara said, uh, by September this year. 
and then fully by 2023 when Bergamo will be the Italian capital of culture. So as uh, Sara mentioned last year at the end of May, FI decided to open its gardens early as a token of recognition to the wounded city of Bergamo, which was severely hit um, by COVID-19 pandemic. This year we will start the first lot with safety interventions that will allow uh, for occasional opening uh, to the public. We will then work on uh, the change of use and uh, opening as a museum, including uh, security and fire prevention systems, conservation work on the collections, and we will restore several rooms to create education rooms for school visits, and finally, the landscape work and the tower restoration. These lots will um, start as soon as funds are uh, found and, uh, and they will go possibly simultaneously uh, as much as possible. So I truly hope that you may consider being part of this journey with us, supporting our efforts and participating actively in the restoration of this magnificent palazzo. We have uh, had some very generous contributions already, but the entire project cost amounts to over 3 million euros. So if there's one or more generous major donors among you, we would love to talk to you. And um, we have naming opportunities and many other benefits that we can offer as in all our properties. So uh, any amount helps, especially donations for projects like this one. So while I uh, ask my colleague to, uh, to pull up the final slides, if you're in Italy uh, this coming weekend on Saturday and Sunday, we uh, be aware that we're holding the five spring days, which are like the uh, heritage days, whereby five volunteers will open over 600 uh, sites all over the peninsula for everyone to discover our immense heritage. It will be uh, um, all in absolute safety with online pre-booking uh, of uh, your visiting uh, day and time. So visit uh, our website www.giornatefai.it. So I would like to remind you that you may join Fine Italy but also Friends of Fine US FI UK in the United Kingdom and FI Swiss in Switzerland and support our, uh, our and their activities. Uh, here you see uh, our email addresses and websites. Donations to these charities are tax deductible and they support FI's mission and projects. As I said, any amounts help. Um, coming up, we will have a final webinar before uh, the summer dedicated to uh, the Olivetti showroom in Venice and the Olivetti typewriters from the MoMA collection with Andrew Gardner, curator at MoMA and Sara, uh, who was with us today on Wednesday, May the 26th at the same time. We will send you the invite, but stay tuned. So I'd like to call up uh, Sara again to say uh, goodbye to all our public. I want to thank you for your time and uh, for staying with us today and ci vediamo and our theme song. Goodbye. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much.